Okay. Hello and welcome to the final in the series of Black History Month events hosted by North Star of GIS. I'm Erica Phillips, proud to say I'm one of the co-founders of North Star of GIS and a principal in GIS for Africa. This month, uh, and I'm going to introduce our speaker in a moment, but before I do, let me go through some background information. This month, we hosted a series of conversations with artists, geothinkers, and innovators. And these conversations were focused on imagining and creating tangible pathways towards a world where equity, feminism, and Black prosperity are realities. So today, we're going to conclude the journey to explore, create, and lead the way to an equitable and feminist future. Guiding our conversation today are four dynamic concepts. Essence, understanding the foundational principles of environmental justice and its relation to data and technology. Imagining, visualizing possibilities and aspirations for an environmentally just utopia. Designing, discussing active participation in creating the environmental justice utopia, and finally shaping, exploring the role of black higher education in influencing an environmentally just future. So these inspiring and action-oriented concepts form the backbone of our dialogue and are crucial for drafting a future that honors and uplifts every member of our global community. So now let me get on to the good stuff. It is an absolute honor to introduce Dr. Robert Bullard. Dr. Bullard is a founding director of the Bullard Center for Environmental and Climate Justice and distinguished professor of urban planning and environmental policy at Texas Southern University. He received his PhD in sociology from Iowa State University. He's co-founder of the HBCU, uh, CBO Gulf Coast Equity Consortium and HBCU Climate Change Consortium and co-chair of the National Black Environmental Justice Network. Dr. Bullard is the author of 18 books that address environmental racism, urban land use, housing, transportation, sustainability, smart growth, climate justice, and community resilience. Dr. Bullard is a proud Vietnam era U.S. Marine Corps veteran. And my first exposure to your work was through your Dumping in Dixie Race, Cla Race, Class, and Environmental Quality. It was the first book to introduce readers to the field of environmental justice uh, back in 1990. Some of your other book titles include Just Sustainabilities, Development in an Unequal World, Highway Robbery, Transportation Racism, and New Roads to Equity, The Quest for Environmental Justice, Human Rights and the Politics of Pollution, Growing Smarter, Achieving Livable Communities, Environmental Justice, and Race, Regional Equity. Uh, the Black Metropolis in the 21st Century, Race, plas, Place, and the Politics of Place. Race, Place, and Environmental Justice after Hurricane Katrina. Environmental Health and Racial Equity in the United States. The Wrong Complexion for Protection. Love this title, it's important for us to talk about how the government response to disaster endangers African-American communities. And finally, you were featured in the July 2007 CNN People You Should Know, um, Bullard, Green Issue is Black and White. In 2008, Newsweek named you one of 13 environmental leaders of the century. And in 2013, you received the Sierra Club's John Muir Award, Award the first African-American to win the award. And in 2014, you were named its new environmental, it's, they named its new environmental justice award after you. In 2015, your alma mater named you, uh, gave you its alumni merit award. And you were also given the George Washington Carver Award. In 2017, these awards go on and on because the work keeps going on and on. In 2017, the Children Environmental Health Network presented you with the Child Health Advocate Award. In 2018, the Global Climate Action Summit named you one of uh, 22 climate trailblazers. In 2019, Apolitical named you the world's one of the world's 100 most influential people in climate policy. Um, Wash, uh, William Ju you received the William Julius Wilson Award for the Advancement of Justice and the Stephen H. Schneider Award for Outstanding Climate Sci Science Communication in 2020. WebMD, which many of us use on a daily basis, um, presented you with its one of its 2020 Health Heroes uh, Trailblazer Awards. And the United Nations Environment and 
Environment Program honored you in 2020 as one of the champions of the earth with a lifetime achievement award. This is the UN's highest environmental honor and it recognizes outstanding leaders from government, civil society and the private sector whose actions have a transformative impact on the environment. Finally, we're getting up to the, the current administration in 2021, President Biden named you to the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. And in 2022, the University of California Berkeley Ecology Law Quarterly gave you the Environmental Leadership Award, um, the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education, honored you with its Lifetime Achievement Award. And closer to home here in Washington, D.C., Georgetown University and the University of Johannesburg jointly awarded you honorary doctorates and you were elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, 2023, the American Geographical Society gave you the John Gould Medal. So it doesn't sound like you were resting on your laurels after dumping in Dixie. Uh, that's quite, a, that's quite a, a big set of footsteps to follow in. But we're hoping that you can, that we can help you continue in this work. We are so honored, as I said, we're very proud to have you here. And we came up with a topic that I think bridges these two communities, you know, the environmental justice community, the GIS community, as you and I were speaking before we started this conversation today. And one of the things that has been a concern of mine is there can be an insular nature between the two communities. GIS people tend to speak to GIS people. The EJ people tend to speak to other EJ people. So I was really excited to have this opportunity to create some cross-pollination and to leverage what you do to speak to our audience and vice versa. So without further ado, I'd like to jump in and start asking you a couple of the questions that we designed to uh, frame a conversation around these topics today. So on essence, I'd like to ask you, how do you see the fight for environmental justice reshaping our understanding of data and technology in Black communities? Well, first of all, uh, thanks for uh, having me uh, on this webinar uh, and happy Black History Month. I think it's important to uh, understand uh, the different tools that are available uh, to assist and support uh, the gathering of information, uh, of, of uncovering uh, mysteries as to uh, why things are the way they are. And having the facts, developing uh, the research me methodologies and, and the research protocols can assist and support that. And I think for a long time, uh, a lot of the uh, data, the tools, uh, uh, and the other kinds of uh, instrumentation was were hidden from uh, black people. It was all it was very mysterious. Uh, but it was not that we couldn't understand it. It was a matter of, of access. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about uh, the role of of uh, research uh, and data, and and how we uh, use the data and how we present it, how we somehow uh, lay it out. Uh, I think it's very important that that uh, uh, individuals listening to uh, this this web or viewing this webinar should understand having the data, having the facts, having the science has never been enough. We must marry uh, all of that with action to get transformative change. And that's what I've tried to do over the last four plus decades. You know, uh, I'm a sociologist and I'm an environmental sociologist. And I, uh, I tell people, I, I, I don't do uh, dead white man sociology. I do what's called scientifically kick-ass sociology, which is framed out of the model of W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, du Bois was, uh, uh, was a researcher. He was a scholar. He was an activist. And he did some of the first studies uh, and looking at uh, empirical data and mapping uh, what was going on in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the Philadelphia Negro, that was a study that was that was one of the first empirical sociological studies in, in the United States. And he mapped uh, what, what the uh, demographics and what were the other kinds of challenges, problems, et cetera. Uh, and that was uh, uh, a long time ago. 
before we even thought about GIS. Right. Uh, so, so I think we have to understand how we have grown, how we have uh, uh, shaped the 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 purpose of of using social science and geography. Uh, this is one of the social science and mapping and, and marrying geography with sociology. That's where you get a lot of the 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 uh, the work that we do in environmental justice. I just want to pull up on this. You talked about kick-ass sociology, right? So, <laughs> which I'm going to be incorporating into my future conversations. But a lot of these tools, I think, can be used to support kick-ass sociology. But what is it that you envision us doing to help create more kick-ass sociologists, right? So what do we need to do as GIS professionals to create the kick-ass sociologists of the future? And my apologies to any children on this on oh. this webinar. <laughs> well, well, let me let me just back up 44 years mm -hmm. and say if GIS um, was available 44 years ago, uh, in Houston, Texas, uh, while I was at Texas Southern University, my job supporting a lawsuit, the first lawsuit to challenge environmental racism using civil rights law uh, that my wife asked me to do a study, my job would have been much easier. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no GIS, there was no uh, Google, there was no mm -hmm. iPad, I, uh, iPhones, none of that. So, But there was maps right? and there was data. Uh, and And what I did, was to uh, uh, by hand and and through uh, uh, what we call today mixed methods approach uh, is to is to develop a research protocol for locating all of the sanitary uh, all of the uh, landfills sanitary landfills incinerators garbage dumps uh, in Houston uh, that that would support a lawsuit, Bean versus Southwest and Waste Management Corporation, uh, that that said uh, that the city of Houston uh, landfills were disproportionately located uh, in black neighborhoods, right. and that was the and this 1978. There was this company wanted to put this landfill in a black middle class suburban neighborhood. I didn't say a poor poverty pocket. I said a black middle class neighborhood where 85 percent of the residents own their homes. There's nothing out there but trees, houses, and, and black people. So what I had to do is to develop a research protocol as to uh, getting the census tracts, in this case, census tracts and the block groups, uh, uh, pulled from the 1970 uh, uh, data and to take those base maps and piece the tracks together, fold out maps and put it on, on poster board and then uh, find all of the landfills, incinerators, and garbage dumps. And then uh, once we did that, there was no database, so we had to do it manually, find them through archival records, and then color code the census tracts with uh, magic markers, yellow less than 10%, uh, orange uh, 10 to 24.9%, uh, green 25 to, uh, let's say, uh, 49%, and then 50% above was red. As it turns out, when we mapped the pens, which were the landfills, incinerators, and garbage dumps, uh, five out of five of the pens for land for city owned landfills were located in the red. Yeah. Six out of eight of the city owned incinerators were located in the red. Yeah. So from 1930 up until 1978, 82 percent of all the pens, the the waste facilities, were located in the red. Now we had to yeah. do that manually. If we had uh, uh, all of that data uh, digitized, like today, uh, we could do that on a on a on a cell phone. But right. we didn't. But that did not stop us from generating those data, generating those maps, and going into court showing that. But having the facts was never enough because we lost in court. the The reason why we lost in court because we couldn't prove intent. Having uh, roadblocks and barriers uh, thrown in front of you can be a major hurdle even when you have the data, you have the facts, you have the science, you have all those things. So in the case of Bean versus Southwestern Waste Management Corporation, we lost the case, but we won the, the battle in terms of developing a legal theory for right. challenging environmental racism 
and we develop the methodology, the tool for mapping, tracking where landfills and solid waste sites are overlaid with racing class. So right. it's on a movement. That was 1979, long time ago. A long time ago, but that is actually a perfect tie-in to my next question, right? So yes, it is easier now to collect data. We we can create citizen scientists. Anybody who's got even a rudimentary cell phone can be part of collecting data. And we see people doing this in all sorts of ways, right? We need to create more citizen scientists. You know, it's not just uh, playing games, but what's in your neighborhood? What's in your backyard? What's in your what's by the school that your children are attending? Uh, attending. But as we're thinking about what was, let me turn our attention to what can be and ask you, what does an environmental justice utopia look like to you? And how do we begin to visualize this? Because we can't make it happen if we don't have in our heads some idea of where we are trying to go. Yes, that's a very good question. And I think it's important uh, to understand that GIS is a tool mm -hmm. and it's a tool that can be used uh, in a way that can advance knowledge, advance um, uh, research, understanding, but it also can advance public policy. For example, I serve on the White House Environmental Just Justice Advisory Council, and there are 26 of us on that council. And we were charged with helping uh, the, the President's Council on Environmental Quality develop a, a tool for advancing the Justice 40 Initiative. The Justice 40 Initiative is an initiative by the, uh, the Biden administration uh, to, to, basically, uh, to basically track, target 40% of the benefits that accrue from moving to a clean energy economy uh, to make sure that those, for, at least 40% of those benefits go to what they're calling disadvantaged communities. Mm -hmm. And the disadvantaged communities uh, 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 can, can be uh, somehow uh, uh, looked at in terms of uh, a metric. In this case, it was developed by OMB to talk about income using poverty income as the metric. Uh, even though we didn't agree with the, just using that that uh, particular one metric, uh, sure. it is one. Right. So, so the 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 CEQ, uh, uh, not without advice, uh, developed this tool. The tool is a GIS tool, and it's basically the the Climate Economic Justice Screening Tool, or CGES. Mm -hmm. That CGES tool, that mapping tool, will determine how billions of dollars will get spent and where those monies will go. And again, when you start overlaying that tool over the, the, the thousands of census tracts in the United States, those, those uh, quote, disadvantaged communities that fall in that, in, in, on that tool will be designated for receiving uh, the benefits in priority programs, whether it's housing, transportation, uh, water systems, or whether it's dealing with uh, environmental protection, legacy pollution, or economic opportunity, whether it's dealing with wind and solar. And if we look at the, for example, the Inflation Reduction Act, mm -hmm. uh, there, there's uh, uh, $369 billion in that act. Uh, and of that $369 billion, that's $60 billion for environmental justice and another 60 billion for clean energy transition. So that's $120 billion. If we just use that uh, uh, amount and talk about 40% of that and overlay that tool, we're talking about a substantial amount of monies, benefits, investments that can go uh, to those communities that historically have been left out and left behind. If we apply the same uh, Justice 40 screen over the inflation, uh, over the bipartisan infrastructure law, that's one point two trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money, forty yep. percent. So, so the so not only is GIS can map the bad stuff, it can also map where opportunities should flow, and where resources should flow, and we can track that, and we can track the money. We can map all of that. That's how GIS can be used in the hands of community groups, organizations, community university partnerships, like our HBCU Climate Change Consortium. We're mapping all of that. We're tracking the money and tracking the extent to which our organizations are benefiting. That's how GIS can be very liberating uh, and also informative and, and build the capacity of organizations on the ground to speak for themselves and do for ourselves. 
that's what we see our environmental justice movement moving forward with empowering our communities with resources and the capacity to speak for themselves and to access resources, whether it's private foundations or government funding. This is great. I, so I, that is part of what you're creating now. I kind of want to think about what it's going to look like. What if you got everything that you wanted? What would it look like? What's it going to be like for your children and your children's children, right? If we create an environmentally just utopia, what what will it be like? What will the world look like? Why? How will my neighborhood be different? How will your neighborhood be different in an environmentally just utopia? Well, I think uh, in an environmentally just utopia, uh, we would not have a zip code uh, determining uh, health and well-being. Right <laughs> now, health yeah. and well -being, the most powerful predictor of health and well-being is Where your zip born. code. So yep. when we talk about building a just, fair, equitable, and resilient society, particularly in the age of climate change, and in the United States, looking in the next 25 years, this country will be majority people of color. So we should not be uh, uh, thinking that somehow we can wait to 2042 to get it right. We need to be planning for the time when, when our children uh, of color right now outnumber uh, whites, but in the future, next 25, 30 years, we will be talking about a general uh, population that looks very different than it looks now. So when we talk about removing those artificial barriers, those mm -hmm. uh, barriers that create uh, social inequality, economic inequality, racial inequality, geographic inequality, inequality and in when it comes to space and place. And again, we're talking about having, for example, our schools, uh, all of them uh, would be LEED certified, quality schools with all kinds of, of um, uh, uh, green infrastructure. We know the science, the data, the research shows that as you green our schools, education, learning, achievement, GPA, all of that goes up. And so mm -hmm. we're talking about uh, 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 addressing uh, and arresting those gaps and, and closing those gaps so that we are not talking about a society where there's so much inequality. And if you go across one uh, a, a zip code or one census strike or across the, the river or across the levee, you can see that difference. Those things would be eliminated because we would have in place uh, a just society that would not be looking at, you know, uh, on your zip code or, or whether or not where you live and that kind of thing. That's what we are planning for. That's what we're working toward. That is our North Star. That is what we see as the uh, ultimate goal of transitioning to that clean a uh, resilient, sustainable society that's just. I, I love the idea that we will be smarter as a result of having a more uh, utopic environment, right? Because I, I feel like we live in a nation of idiots right now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to live in a nation of idiots. I don't want the next generation and the generation after that to live in a nation of idiots. So if we can have a, a an environmental justice utopia. We have a smarter nation and a smarter world. I'm all on board for that. Um, let, let's talk about creating this. So in your view, how can Black communities become more involved in actively shaping and creating tech solutions? What do we need to do on the ground? Uh, what we need to do is to step up and step up fast uh, mm. because our young people right now uh, many of them have have few wedges that that uh, that keep us apart. I am a boomer, proud of it, still fighting, still standing. <laughs> but Gen X's, Y, Z, Zoomers outnumber my generation, and so we have to make sure that young people uh, understand that they have to accelerate this whole movement toward a just, fair, and equitable society. And we have to make sure that that all in our elementary schools, middle schools, high school, college and universities, and even postgraduate, we have to make sure that there are no fields uh, of learning, no disciplines that somehow lock us out or block us from mo uh, moving into those, into those spheres. And I think when we are allowed to uh, have those opportunities, we excel. For example, it is no accident that the first environmental justice centers in the United States, 
at academic institutions. All five of them were at historically black colleges and universities. I did not know that. No, I most people know don't that. know that. Uh, mm -hmm. And for and at, and for a decade, these five centers: the center at Xavier University in New Orleans, the center at Clark Atlanta University that I started in 1994, the center at Hampton University, center at Florida A and M University, and the legal clinic at Thurgood Marshall School of Law, uh, where I am now in Houston. These five centers. There were no other centers in the United States at academic institutions. We provided the the legal theories. We provided the research methodologies. We provided the studies. I've written 18 books, and 15 of those books were written while I was at HBCUs. Mm -hmm. Understanding that every social movement that has been successful in the United States has had strong youth and students. The civil rights movement, peace and justice, anti-war, women's movement, environmental justice movement, climate justice movement. So what? We, and, and black folks have been at the forefront on all of those movements. When we have been following or when he, we have been kept out, those movements have not progressed as as fast and as furious as they as as we know they would. For a long time, the environmental movement was a white middle class movement only, yep. Yep. and it was stuck in the mud. It was only when the environmental justice movement coming um, uh, in force and bringing women, for example, at the forefront. It is no accident that the environmental justice movement. Historically, and even to this day, uh, the, the over 75% of our organizations are led by strong women warriors and understanding that our movements, are str movements, all movements are stronger when we somehow get away from, you know, the sexism and, and, the, and, the, and the wanting to have only certain uh, groups at the leadership role. So we have to make sure that we even black people now, we have to somehow move away from that sexism and, and that and, and somehow uh, tone down that testosterone and allow the very best to excel. <laughs> That's our movement. That's our future. And when we somehow uh, keep that old system uh, in place, we don't excel. I, I can't I can't agree with you more. I was looking for uh, you were actually dovetailing with so many of our themes for this year at North Star of GIS. It's almost like, are you one of us or <laughs> we need to have you on board over here, Dr. Boyd, because you are definitely speaking our language. And um, but again, I you know how I'm thinking about how do we do this, right? I know that there are often times when when we're engaging, when I am engaging, let me speak for myself, when I'm engaging with Gen X, Y, Z, when I go like, oh my goodness, right? I know, I know. <laughs> I don't can't do that, don't right? That's up. not helpful. It's not helpful. I, I want to be part of a different solution. I want to have a conversation that engages um, and gives me opportunities to, to, transmit and uh, information transmit lessons that we have learned along the way you know this is not to say that the way it has been done has to be the way it will be done in the future but so we've got to find the language that engages younger people in our communities and gets them fired up but you said step up fast right we don't we cannot afford um we don't have a luxury. We don't have the luxury of time, right? The impacts of all of these uh, decisions are so much greater for us than for anybody else, right? It's, it, yeah. Yeah. but how do I, what do I need to do today, tomorrow? What do I need to do on Saturday to encourage somebody to step up faster, right? I, <laughs> how do I bottle Dr. Bullard and say, you know, and, and Dr. Bullard, and you, you, we talked before we started, you know, a lot of the same people I know, but I, yeah. we, we've yeah. got to get, people fired up you know this is not we don't have time it's not on our side no no i i tell i tell my students and and i tell my students i have students who have students who have students mm -hmm. and the fact that this this quest for justice um is a it's a race but it's not a sprint this is like a marathon relay i know there's no such re, uh, race but <laughs> you run your 26.2 miles mm -hmm. and then you pass the baton to the next generation next generation but you don't stop uh, as a mentor or a cheerleader. You 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 mentor and you cheerlead, and and when they need these young people need assistance, you support. You don't step in front of them. Uh, you let them. In some cases, uh, they make mistakes, but you don't hold that against them. You tell them there's a roadmap to success, 
and you can you can do this. And again, that mentoring is so important. I had excellent mentors. And, you know, I, I am a sociologist, but I received, uh, I forget what year it was, an honorary geographer's award from the American Geographical uh, Association. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I said, I've been called a lot of things, but I've never been called an honorary geographer. But, but the idea is this work uh, will call you to do the kind of work that this is almost like you're on a mission. Mm -hmm. And having geographers who can talk to uh, 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 epidemiologists, toxicologists, ge uh, geographers, economists, lawyers, and having uh, GIS experts who understand uh, uh, vide uh, videography, and we get storyboards. We got ge uh, geographers, ge uh, geographic uh, information specialists that are able to go into communities and break it down, do the training and very technical kind of stuff, but can do it in a way that is not intimidating. We need the, to put that human aspect in it when you deal with communities. Yeah, There's indigenous knowledge in communities. There's understanding. There's a way of knowing. We have to be um, uh, very uh, uh, agile. Right. Uh, we have to be able to roll with the flow. And I tell young people that you have to really be uh, 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 not just ambidextrous, but you have to be able to multitask in a lot of ways. We want specialists, but we also want people who can work across the various disciplines and understand the languages and, and how we can can get young people, uh, uh, young people mentoring young people, right. peer to peer kinds of work. Right. And there's a lot of ways, we're doing it now. For example, we get our center, Bullet Center uh, at Texas Southern University, we're getting calls from foundations who call us and say, we want to give you four or five million dollars. Not a, no application, but a Zoom call. Now, we never had that uh, luxury uh, 25, 30, 40 years ago, but it's happening right. in the last five years. Right. They see the work and then they want to say, we want to give you money. Uh, we have two million dollars uh, last year to start this Environmental Justice Climate Corps undergraduates at HBCUs to do summer internships, paid, of course, and to strengthen their relationship with communities. Because a lot of our communities, uh, students at HBCUs, they come from the very communities that we are trying to deal with on the front line of climate change or on or in environmental sacrifice zones or other kinds of, of challenges that impact uh, of where money and infrastructure has not gone. So we have to make sure that young people take this these issues today and own them. Like my generation in the 60s, we were fearless. We were not afraid to go to jail. Well, my daddy said, don't you go to jail. <laughs> we're not afraid of, of fire hoses and dogs and all that stuff. But the idea is you have to you have to understand that there, you have to believe in a cause. And if that's your cause, you are willing to take it to the line. Yeah. And you are willing to make some sacrifices when it comes to uh, how you spend your dollar. I mean, we in some cases... Our young people who are in large numbers, sometimes we have to go uh, to to our pocketbook and say we're not going to buy certain things. Yeah. And yes, there is a B word. Uh, it's called boycott yep. and selective buying. We have to use all those strategies to say, no, we're not going to allow uh, these companies to 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 somehow disrespect us in what they produce and what they and where they put their plants and how they pollute or whatever. We have to be uh, have to have our young people take strong stands, and they are. And and as I said before, there are there are young people out there that are doing excellent work. A lot of it, you know, doesn't get reported in, you know, in the big newspapers: New York Times, Washington Post, Houston Chronicle, Atlanta Journal Constitution, L.A. Times, Chicago Defense, uh, uh, Tribune. But again, just because it's not reported doesn't mean it's happening. Right. If you do good work. Uh, sometimes it might take 40 years for you before you get recognized, <laughs> but you don't do it for the recognition. You do it to get results. Yes. And when the community says thanks or thank you, Dr. Bullard, we won, we celebrate and we celebrate uh, and we celebrate, but we don't celebrate too long because there's so many things that are still coming at us. Amen. So you said two things that I, and I'm keeping an eye on time because we do want to open up to questions from the audience. First of all, I, 
congratulations on the paid internships because those internships have been one of the ways that have kept our communities from fully participating in getting access to technology, getting the experiences they need to be partners in the future, right? So kudos on that. But last week we had a presentation, um, Aisha Jenkins and Joshua Okeke were speaking about monitoring, evaluation, accountability, and learning about meal, right? And as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about last week's conversation. And for those of you who are who are new to this presentation by North Star of GIS, even though it's the last day of Black History Month, all of the uh, prior sessions will be available on YouTube. So I'm, I'm going to urge you to take a look at some of the sessions that you may have missed, they'll, they'll still be there for you on YouTube and we'll post a link to that. Um, but one of the things I heard last week was the importance of creating protocols that are accessible to the communities that you are trying to support, right? So you can't make the, the survey instruments or whatever technology you're using so advanced that it's not accessible to the people that you are trying to support. So I'm, I'm really excited to hear this conversation build upon the one that we had last week. And this leads me to my fourth and final question for you before we open up to the audience. And this one is all in your wheelhouse. How pivotal is the role of black higher education in influencing and molding the future of technology? And I, I think you've already partially answered this question, but let's <laughs> let's dive, do, dive a little deeper into this one. Yes, I think it's very important. Uh, uh, having a higher education, and particularly the role of our HBCUs, uh, there are 104 of them, but those 104 institutions have an outsized footprint in producing uh, uh, folks who are doing all kinds of things, whether it's technology, whether it's health, medicine, uh, whether it's the social sciences, uh, law. And I think we have to make sure that our institutions receive the kinds of funding and support that we can get. For example, uh, uh, Texas Southern University, the Bullet Center, received a $50 million uh, grant from uh, EPA on its uh, thriving communities, environmental justice, technical uh, uh, support programs and grant makers program. There, there are a number of, of grants that were made uh, in this category. Our job on this grant, for example, is to streamline the applications for EPA grants uh, and to assist uh, our uh, community-based organizations uh, get those grants with that streamlined application with the technical assistance on all kinds of, of issues that impact our communities, whether it's small businesses that have somehow been locked out of the 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 uh, 1.2 trillion dollars in the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law, or whether it's the Inflation Reduction Act, or or other kinds of programming, uh, and, and so that we can make sure that that uh, access to opportunity, uh, whether it's training, or whether it's workforce development, whether it's greening our schools, all those things uh, will take information uh, and and accessing technology, accessing uh, the kinds of data, and our HBCUs. Have, have played that role and are playing that role. And we are making sure that when we get in positions uh, to advise, uh, whether it's a White House or whether it's a government or, or whatever it is, that we, sub, that we are strong advocates for our institutions. We are strong advocates for community university partnerships. We are strong advocates for our HBCU, uh, black owned business partnerships, roles that we know, whether it's banks, uh, whether it's uh, uh, small businesses in various fields. W if we don't do it, uh, we can't expect anybody else to do it. We have to take care of our own when it comes to advancing opportunity, open doors, and making sure that we have uh, uh, individuals, organizations, businesses that are prepared to compete. So it can never be said, well, we are looking for some, but we just can't find them. No, we don't want that excuse uh, for 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 uh, uh, our groups and organizations, businesses to be in those rooms and 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 to be uh, at those tables uh, and to be recipients of those funds uh, uh, when when uh, when they are available. I love that. Well, I know one of the things that I'm going to be doing for sure is making sure people know about those first five EJ centers. That I'm like, how am I this age and I did and involved with the people that I'm involved with and I did not know this, right? So, you know, I we each have responsibilities to hold up the light, right? Each of us has something that we can do. So that's one of the things I'm taking upon um, myself. 
Um, and thinking also, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes. There's so much good stuff that you were speaking about and I couldn't write all of it down, but I'm um, thinking about this role of ed becoming advocates, right? How can we become better advocates for the institutions that, that support our communities? What, is there some takeaway for our audience that you'd like each of them to do to become a better advocate? What can they do today or tomorrow? Well, I think it's important again is to uh, is to find uh, what your passion is, and to do the search uh, and and see what organizations and institutions that are out there doing this work. Now, if you Google uh, environmental justice, uh, you'll see a few names that will come up at the top of the list. And in terms of how those names uh, work together, for example, uh, the Bullet Center, we work with uh, the Deep South Center, Dr. Beverly Wright in New Orleans. We work with sure. uh, uh, WEAC in, in Harlem, uh, sure. which Peggy Miller helped found mm -hmm. and Peggy Shepherd. You know, Peggy you know, and Bernice. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you have to talk about Bernice Miller Travis. If we don't do anything else, we got to give a shout out to her work. Yeah, yeah. So, so the idea is, or Sokovi uh, Wilson at, at, uh, at, at Maryland. Uh, who who was a a, 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 ment a mentee of mine, not a student, and we went to the same university, Alabama A and M University, undergraduate. So there's a there's a, a a cadre of of black professionals, researchers, scientists, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, and grassroots organizations that we work with that we are doing some fantastic work, and now the resources are beginning to flow, and so it means that we can do more. Uh, we can we can reach more communities in need. Uh, we can we have more staff uh, to now to to somehow battle uh, the the that that uh, that those polluters who are uh, looking for places to put the bad stuff that that uh, other people don't want. And we say no. We say no to our children. Uh, black children have a, a asthma death rate that's eight times that of white children, and it's because of so much uh, pollution in our communities. And we talk about having, making sure that we uh, resolve many of the challenges that face our community by coming together in collaborations, in consortia, in partnerships. Uh, the day is over for the long, the lone wolf or the lone university just doing it by itself with collaboration, with consortia. We are a powerful force. We won, you know, multi-million dollar uh, uh, grants, contracts, and work when we collaborate. Uh, we say we're very competitive, but we are not at the point of, of competing to kill each other off. We work in partnerships, and that's how we have been able to uh, advance and progress. And, uh, and it's exciting times. It is an exciting time. And even with, with the investments that are being made, it's still, it's a drop in the bucket compared to the amount of harm that's already been done. And it, we, yes. we're just about uh, coming up at a, the 45 minute mark on this hour. So I would like to open up and I see that we've got some questions in the chat. I'm going to read a couple of them out and see if we can get your take on those. Um, from Aisha, what are some of the ways that we can go about developing a pipeline for black professors in environmental science and what obstacles do we need to remove? That's a very good question. And we have to start in elementary school, <laughs> in some <laughs> cases, preschool. We have to get our young people and their programs to do that, introducing young people to STEM, making it exciting, not boring, and, and making sure that we have uh, 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 black uh, uh, mentors, having young people see that you can do science, see that you can uh, uh, win awards, see that you can you know, be on TV, be an expert so that you can do all those things. And we have to start early and we have to maintain that that mentoring and maintain those resources to young people so that the, so that um, uh, re, uh, so that money is not a barrier to, mm -hmm. to smart people, smart young people who we, we who want to uh, do this work and advance in every field. I say there's no shortage um, of uh, I mean, no, there's no oversupply of of, of talent and skills and whatever that, that we can somehow not tap into. For example, we, we have to make sure that we generate the kind of environment that's, that's uh, welcoming, that's pleasing, uh, and, and that where young people can feel that this is something that they really want to do and, and feel that, that, that they can do it in a way that 
they they don't get criticized as being smart. I mean, where <laughs> in the hell did that come from? You have to Ooh, apologize for being smart. You have to That's apologize. A That's a, a we're going to be here for another hour if we go down that no, road. <laughs> no, I, I know. I, I lived it. I had to apologize that I had written 10 books. People didn't say, well, you, you can't relate to us. I said, yes, I can, because I've been black most of my life. Uh, it's like, okay. So so we have to uh, somehow challenge those stereotypes and 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 those those barriers in many cases that we put up in front of us. And maybe Knock some naming conventions, because I know I would have taken some more sociology classes if some of them had been called kick-ass sociology. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I need some help from our team. Are there more questions from the audience? Well, I, look, I've, I've got questions for days. I can sit with Dr. Bullard forever. So <laughs> if you all have questions, this is your chance to go before I, you know, before I use up the rest of our time today. Any other questions? I, I see a lot of people who are excited about this conversation. So I, I know that we are planting seeds here today and that somebody's going to leave this um, conversation and go out and do something differently today. Okay, Ayana King, how do we bring oh, the newcomers, in, uh, immigrants in particular? Thank you, Ayana, into the EJ movement. Everybody in North Star of GIS knows that I have been a particular advocate for opening up this platform uh, to go beyond the boundaries of the United States, right? Everybody in North Star of GIS knows this about me. So Ayana, thank you so much for this question. Dr. Bullard, what do you think we need to do to bring newcomers into the EJ movement? Okay. Hi, Ayana. <laughs> How you doing? Okay. Uh, I think we have to uh, really understand that what's happening in the United States uh, actually is... Uh, is a microcosm what what's happening around the world globally when we talk about a lot of these uh, issues when it comes to uh, uh, how uh, pollution tracks with income and race, and and how uh, how the worst impacts, for example, of climate change, maps closely with with uh, uh, developing countries, uh, low middle income countries, with third world countries, whatever. Uh, I received, this is uh, an aside, I received uh, a PhD, uh, uh, honorary doctorate degree from Georgetown University in October, that's October. I also received an honorary doctorate from the University of Johannesburg. The, 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 the honorary doctorate from U University of Johannesburg was so exciting because it was given by a university on the continent. And that university is doing some excellent uh, mapping work as it relates to uh, what's, what's happening in in South Africa, as it relates to post-apartheid, post -apartheid, in quotes, uh, and and looking at uh, load uh, load shedding in terms of energy racism, and and again looking at uh, using mapping, using GIS, and having young people involved uh, with with um, uh, community uh, science, citizen science, uh, and, and using that science to impact policy, because the 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 electric company uh, that that was operated under apartheid is the same electric company, the power company, and they and they are providing electricity for for all of the country. But at the same time, there's a there's an apartheid system overlaid with who whose lights go out and who lights stay out longer, and it maps with race. And so it's about liberation using GIS, using mapping for liberation. Even though you have ended the apartheid, you still have uh, energy apartheid. So, so the idea of taking this justice framework uh, has that we developed uh, at the first People of Color Summit, 17 principles of environmental justice, and the first principle is that overlay is that people most impacted must speak for themselves, must have the resources to uh, impact policy to change that. That's a our environmental justice principles are global, mm -hmm. and the climate justice principles. Uh, uh, was derived from those uh, environmental justice principles. So, so young people around the world now are are actually the catalyst for changing uh, uh, the movement when it comes to climate. It's young people around the world that's the energy force that's moving climate justice, whether it's climate finance, loss and damage, uh, 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 poverty alleviation, and 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 reparations. 
So, so yes, young people, uh, you have to uh, uh, claim it and and own it, and 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 us uh, veterans, uh, uh, elders, we have to stand with you, not stand in front of you, stand with you. And when you need us, we have to be intergenerational mobilizing to get this uh, uh, across the, the justice. Finish we can line. give you a boost, right? They can stand on some shoulders, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, there's a question that I'm trying, I, I saw it go across the bottom of the screen and it looked very interesting and I can't quite get it back yet. Uh, what would you invite a cadre of melanated and mapping volunteers to do to support your work? There's a group called melanated and mapping. They want to help. What can they do to support your work? Yes, there, there's so much that can be done. And I think the, the idea of connecting uh, that mapping work uh, to organization needs. And again, uh, there, there's a, a great opportunity to, uh, we, we are developing right now at the Bullet Center uh, and as a call for organizations, uh, people of color organizations for this new directory. And the directory has people of color organizations and it has uh, uh, resource organizations and it has environmental experts. But the people of color organizations identify what their what their issues are, what their needs are, and and what kinds of uh, uh, strategies they're using. So uh, if you go to our website, uh, there's a way that you can kind of like glean through what people are saying they need, and whether it's water justice or whether it's energy or whether it's food mm -hmm. and food and uh, uh, water security issues or whether it's planning in terms of mapping transportation. I mean, uh, uh, urban sustainability, agriculture. I mean, there's a lot. We have black organizations that are doing so much, but there's still a lot of need. So yes. uh, uh, identify an organization. This is not rocket science. You don't have to you know, make a major project out of uh, identifying the group. But once you identify the group <laughs> and then uh, don't parachute in uh, <laughs> uninvited, I mean, invite yourself, get to know, explore. You could do a lot of uh, introductions via Zoom first. And if there are organizations in the in the place where the member uh, want to work, then you can uh, uh, do a, a email or call, introduce yourself, and and you know the usual kind of get to know. And yeah. that that there's no substitute for that human interaction. Right. We are human beings, and we are social animals. So uh, do that interaction in a way that's respectful, uh, and and you will find that that you could be very helpful. We found that to be uh, more important than than these big organizations that are out there with websites and and that kind of thing. That human interaction and human touch is very important. And those are long lasting relationships. In yeah. some cases, we've had partnerships with our centers that have outlasted marriages. And so we have to understand that that it's about relationships. <laughs> it's a marriage of a different kind, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Uh, this has been such an exciting conversation. We've got about five more minutes before we're going to shut off here. Let me see if there are any final questions from the audience. And um, uh, here we are. Uh, are any EJ centers reaching down to those elementary, junior high and high school students to challenge and engage them? And that's from Marva King. Thank you, Marva. We love you. Hey, Marva. How you doing? Man? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, the, our EJ centers and our HBCU consortia uh, is developing uh, uh, curricula uh, and programs and activities for for uh, uh, K through 12. As a matter of fact, at our, each of our HBCU climate change consortium uh, 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 conferences, HBCU climate change cons uh, conferences, we've had young people uh, 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 K through 12 presenting poster sessions, being on panels at our at our conference. And again, our conference is held in New Orleans every year. We've had nine of them, uh, and we, we missed two years with COVID. But uh, we always have our conference in New Orleans because uh, young people like to go to New Orleans, and we don't know why. But uh, we have no problem getting young people. But having those kids come in and present, and they are very sophisticated in what they're doing in terms of uh, 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 testing air with the air monitors and testing water. And, mm -hmm. and actually doing GIS, you know, in fifth yeah. grade, sixth grade, doing excellent GIS work. And yep. so, yeah, we have to start early and uh, keep them engaged and keep them interested in this work. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask as a, as a parting question, right? You've received awards. Your organization is being funded. You've done this work for 40, almost 50 years. So you've been involved in this. You're, you're still going forward, right? But you're, you're building a platform for others, right? And I just want to tie this back to our initial questions about environment envisioning that environmentally just utopia, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, 100 years from, okay, let's say 50, because I can't even imagine 100 years from now. Let's go forward 50, right? You, you couldn't have imagined today 50 years ago, but it's 50 years from today, right? We're, we're looking at 2074, February 28th or 9th. I don't know if that's a leap year. Um, what do you, what do you want to see? What would make you go like, yes, it was worth it. It was worth all the struggle, it was worth all of the late nights. Um, what would make it worthwhile for you? Well, uh, I think what would uh, make it worthwhile is that to see uh, uh, that there there is uh, this dismantled uh, barriers that that have kept uh, people back uh, because of uh, race, uh, class, gender, etc. And to see opportunity thir uh, thir uh, uh, flourishing, and to and to see this this whole idea of of uh, we we're living uh, in a peaceful uh, society uh, where where there's uh, opportunities to excel and achieve to one's ability, and where uh, there there are where there's a democracy uh, that is a true democracy. Uh, where, where uh, your rights are respected, and uh, and, and and to and to uh, have uh, comfort, but not at the expense of others or at the expense of the environment. I think Amen. that would be a very uh, utopian, ideal world. And uh, and uh, fifty years from now, it would be great if I could be here and help you. But... <laughs> Well, you can you can take my spot. I don't want to be here. I will give you my spot, Dr. Bullard. It has been an honor to have this conversation with you. I'm so pleased to finally meet you, sort of, kind of in person. Um, for the audience that participated, we really appreciated your questions, your engagement, your involvement in this uh, Black History Month series. Um, there, <laughs> tomorrow starts our uh, Women's History Month or Women's Month uh, programming. So you will see additional programming there. I'm inviting all of you to visit northstarofgis.org, visit Dr. Bullard, visit the Bullardcenter.org. Look for both of us. Look for the Bullard Center. Look for North Star of GIS. If you're so inclined, please feel free to make a contribution to North Star of GIS. And um, we didn't get the hundred million dollars, so we still need some contributions from lay people, Dr. Bullard. Um, Thank you. Uh, thank you. Look for us on YouTube. There also look out for the uh, North Star Gaze, our uh, podcast series that has started. There are so many ways that you can engage with North Star GIS and with the Bullard Center, but I just want to say thank you. Thank you to the team at North, at North Star of GIS that helped make this possible. David Castillo and your st staff, Dr. Bullard, we truly appreciate them as well. So thank you all very much for participating today and look to YouTube for replays of all of our Black History Month event sessions. It's been a pleasure. Have a great afternoon, evening, morning, depending upon where you are. Thank you.